Hello there! Since you love the first part of Nickelodeon's Lost episode so much, today we bring you three more of the scariest Lost episodes. Do you have any idea which ones they might be? You already know which one is going to be number one, but leave us in the comments which you think will be the other two. Are you ready? Today in Draw My Life, the Lost episode of SpongeBob SquarePants. Does anyone remember the SpongeBob episode the Sponge Who Could Fly, that aired in March 2003? It was dubbed The Lost Episode, based on the storyline where Patchy the Pirate uses a treasure map to find the SpongeBob episode that he lost. That night I saw something that wasn't exactly what I expected to see. I still don't understand the reason why the producers make these episodes. For whatever their reason, their ultimate goal is that they don't get released and remain lost. Sadly, what I experienced the night before the episode aired was something out of the ordinary. I remember I was sick with some kind of virus. I was vomiting almost every five minutes and I felt too ill to fall asleep, so I stayed up and watched TV. Around 2.30 a.m., my stomach started to settle, so I planned to turn off the TV and get some sleep. But as I was reaching for the remote control, the opening for the SpongeBob TV show started playing. SpongeBob was my favorite show at that time, so I couldn't miss out on watching it. Although, I thought it was kind of weird that they were showing SpongeBob in the middle of the night. When the opening began, I noticed the animation wasn't finished. There were moments where the characters froze or moved unnaturally. Also, for some reason, the theme song was playing backwards. It made me a little uncomfortable, but also intrigued because it's not very often to see flaws like this one in well-known shows. The title card read, Lost Episode. So I figured that there was a mistake, and Nickelodeon was accidentally airing The Sponge Who Could Fly. The episode started with Spongebob sitting on his bed, slouched and looking downward with a joyless look. He definitely didn't look as energetic as he always does. Spongebob is so optimistic all the time. Why would he be acting like this? After about 10 seconds of seeing Spongebob like this, he louted a big sigh, then looked over to his bedside barrel, and the screen zoomed in on a bottle that was sitting beside his clock. Once the screen zoomed in close enough to read the text on the bottle, it showed that it was a bottle of vodka. The show then panned to a scene with a much brighter contrast, showing Spongebob taking a shot of vodka, then running off smiling and laughing as always. The fact that Spongebob had to drink alcohol to be, well, himself, made me feel uneasy. Mainly because alcohol isn't something that should be taken lightly, and that you would especially not expect to find in a kid's cartoon. The screen then flipped back to the original scene of Spongebob looking distressed, while at the same time changing the contrast back to the darker one. The screen froze on Spongebob for a few seconds, then flickered to a new scene. Spongebob was walking around his living room as he tumbled and knocked things over around him. It seems like he had drunk so much that he couldn't keep himself straight. Everything around him was a mess. There were empty pizza boxes on the floor, cans of beer, and every kind of trash laying around. Gary was also under a pile of garbage. He looked dehydrated and neglected as if he had not eaten anything in days. As Spongebob was walking around with the bottle of vodka in his hand, someone knocked on the door. As Spongebob was heading for the door, he lost his balance and fell to the ground. He opened the door and it was Squidward, who immediately started complaining about the noise. He said that his fuss prevented him from practicing the clarinet. Spongebob began to mumble, and Squidward couldn't understand a word he was saying. Squidward started to yell, complaining about Spongebob's drinking problems. You could tell that Spongebob was losing his cool. Squidward continued yelling that he had had enough of many years of putting up with his stupidity. Immediately after Spongebob heard the word stupidity, he looked Squidward in the eyes and said, I'm the one who was tired of you. He quickly swung the bottle in his hand and smashed it in his face. Spongebob struck him so hard that the shards of glass had stuck in his face. Squidward screamed in pain, but quickly stood up and with the tip of his clarinet, knocked out Spongebob's both teeth. Streams of blood started shooting out of his gums. Spongebob fell to the ground and in desperation, he looked around for any rest of the broken bottle. He found a large piece and grabbed it with his bare hands, hurting himself. He lunged at Squidward and cut off all of his legs. He fell to the ground and smashed Gary. Splashes of blood painted the walls. Spongebob stood still for a while and then lost his mind. The adrenaline kicked in and Spongebob didn't seem drunk anymore. His eyes turned black and blood started dripping from his mouth. He climbed on top of Squidward and a deep voice came out of his mouth. This is for killing Gary and began to hit him as hard as he could. Squidward started yelling, begging him to stop and that it wasn't his fault. 
SpongeBob ignored the screams and smashed his face. With each punch, the shards of glass pierced in his face got deeper and deeper into his skin. There was blood everywhere. After a few seconds, the scream ceased, and SpongeBob took the last few swings and stopped to take a breath. The adrenaline went away, and he realized what he had done. He stood there for a while, trying to deal with the blood scene. He started shaking Squidward to wake him up, but sadly it was pointless. He had killed him. SpongeBob panicked and screamed in tears, What have I done? He stayed there crying. The image faded to black. The next scene showed SpongeBob at his desk with a cigarette in his hand, a piece of paper and a pencil. He had red eyes, dark eye bags, and looked exhausted as if he hadn't slept for days. Instead of staying at one contrast, the colors kept on flickering from light to dark. SpongeBob gripped the pencil in his hand and began to write on the paper, reading what he was writing. I can't take it anymore, he said. As soon as he got that sentence out, a faint noise started playing in the background. It sounded like a child crying. The noise continued playing as SpongeBob continued writing. My life has been horrible and it hasn't gotten better. I can't move on. All I can think about is a mistake that ruined my life. If I had listened to you and put the drinking aside, nothing would have happened. I want to ask for your forgiveness, but I can't. I can't even forgive myself. SpongeBob stopped writing and started weeping loudly. The screen froze for a few seconds, then the show continued with SpongeBob writing his final words. The contrast stayed dark and the cries stopped. It was absolute silence except for SpongeBob saying, Goodbye. SpongeBob quickly stood up, grabbed a gun he had in the desk. He pointed the gun at his forehead and took a long sigh. A shot was heard, and SpongeBob collapsed onto the floor and lay there motionless until the screen turned to static. Needless to say, I was scared out of my mind, and sleep was out of the question. Recently, I've been looking for this episode all over the internet, but not even one website seems to have it. If you ever recognize this episode, please contact me as soon as possible. Today in Draw My Life, the true story of Dora the Explorer. That's right, you heard right. However, I warn you from now on, don't expect to find yourself a lost episode full of blood and paranormal phenomena. Today, we're going to run into a much more terrifying story because of how real it is. We're going to tell you about the true origin of Dora the Explorer. Yes, the series is based on a true story whose main ingredient is, do you dare to discover the truth? Stay until the end, and since you're here, subscribe. Don't be shy, we know that you're passionate about these type of stories. It was the 90s. Kenny Garcia, future creator of the famous series Dora the Explorer, spent his college summers volunteering in El Paso, Texas, along the border with Mexico. There, he helped people who came into the U.S. in search of a better life. Kenny had chosen that volunteer destination because of his Mexican ancestry. It was in the summer of 95 that his life changed forever. That year, migration in Mexico had increased a lot due to the economic crisis the country was going through. In fact, the year before, Bill Clinton had begun to build a wall that was going to divide the two countries. Kenny wasn't at all surprised to see the immigration center crowded with people. Sometimes he even thought that he was becoming numb to the pain. But this idea went out of his head when he met Dora Marquez. It was 8 a.m. on a June day, but the heat was already beginning to rage. Kenny anticipated it was going to be a hot day, although he had no idea how hot it was. Fortunately, he came with an iced coffee to start off strong. Once at the immigration center, he looked at the list of people who had arrived since the day before. There were 10 new names. He took the last sip of coffee, tossed the plastic cup in the trash, put down his notebook, and entered into the new arrivals lounge. It was a place that Kenny hated, and in fact, that's why he was there. It seemed so inhumane to him that he saw it very necessary that there would be someone with a hint of humanity in his heart to treat people with the love and respect they deserve and make their stay a little bit better. The thing was that Kenny entered the room. People's eyes were filled with terror, so much that it was even difficult for him to keep his gaze on them. He looked around the room as usual and something caught his eyes. A little girl, huddled in a corner, stared at him as she hugged her stuffed animal tightly. Driven by a mysterious force, Kenny approached her and crouched to get closer. The girl immediately put her whole body in tension. Kenny asked her her name and if she had come alone, to which the little girl replied that her name was Dora Marquez, and then she just shrugged her shoulders. 
Kenny looked around but didn't think any of those adults were responsible for Dora. He asked the girl if she needed anything, but she didn't respond. Kenny got up and went to talk to his partner, Sarah. He asked her if she had been present when they had brought little Dora Marquez and if she had any more information about her. Sarah replied that it was she who had received her. Apparently, they found her in the middle of the desert when it began to dawn. She was alone and on the verge of hyperthermia. She was carrying a backpack with a phone number on it, possibly from her parents, who hadn't answered the calls, and a filthy stuffed animal. Everything pointed to the fact that she had been brought in from a mob. The amazing thing was that she was still alive. Kenny returned to the girl. Compassionate, he brought her some sweets. The little girl drew a shy smile on her face, which grew bigger as she took the first bite. He felt that he could try again and ask what happened to her, so he asked her where her parents were. With a thin voice, she said that her mother was at home in Mexico, but that her father had passed over the other side a long, long time ago. At first, he got a job and sent them money, but there was a day when he stopped doing it. For this reason, her mother spoke with some gentleman who picked her up at her house, put her in a van and traveled for several days. First, they treated her well, but later they said ugly things to her. They were bad men. Little by little, Dora became more confident with Kenny. One day, the little girl asked her friend if he had a map. Kenny looked at her strangely, and she explained that her dad worked at a bowling alley, and maybe if he let her a map, she could find the bowling alley and get to him. Kenny looked at her sadly. The little girl's naivety broke his heart, but he knew that there was no map that could find this man who didn't want to take care of his daughter. Kenny simply replied that he didn't have a map. Days passed, but the procedures for Dora's future didn't advance. Nobody claimed the little girl. Kenny was trying to find out what they were going to do with her, but since he was a simple volunteer, he couldn't access that information. Dora and Kenny became very good friends and laughed a lot together. In fact, Dora had the most contagious laugh that Kenny had ever heard. Despite the spawn, the girl couldn't be separated from the filthy stuffed monkey. So one day, Kenny asked her why she liked him so much. Dora's expression suddenly changed and she became very sad. In a low voice, she told him that it was his little brother's Diego. Kenny asked her if her little brother had stayed with her mom. Dory replied that no, that Diego had died a year ago. He was born very sick and didn't reach three years of age. Kenny didn't know what to say and chose to hug the little girl. One morning, Kenny arrived early with good news for the girl. A family wanted to meet her to adopt her. When he went to tell Dora, he was horrified to see her with a disfigured face full of bruises and wounds. He impatiently asked what had happened to her. Tears welled up in the girl's eyes and she told Kenny that that night while she was sleeping, one of the new boys had come to and tried to steal her backpack. She tried to stop him, but as he had more strength than her, he ripped it off. She started screaming and he threatened her that if she didn't shut up, he would beat her up. However, it was too late because the security person had already been alerted. Dora pretended to be asleep, but when the guard left, the bully got up, grabbed the girl, pushed her, and then started kicking her. Out of fear, none of those presents came out to defend her. When he finished unleashing his anger on the girl, he picked up Dora's stove animal and tore its head off. With tears in her eyes, Dora showed her beloved smashed stuffed animal to Kenny. Kenny looked up and faced the bully, but this only made things worse. Since that day, every time Kenny left the center, he did so with the fear of thinking that maybe this was the last time he would see Dora. Every morning, the girl woke up with a new wound, and even if he asked to be separated from that madman, nobody did anything. The girl was locked in a nightmare from which no one, not even her best friend, could get her out. Summer was coming to an end, and Kenny had to go back to college no matter how much it hurt. The last day, he came with a gift for Dora. The little girl's eye lit up when she saw the map of the United States. He also wrote her emergency phone numbers, and of course his. The day passed, and it was time to say goodbye. Kenny promised that he would come every week. At first, it was not difficult for him to fulfill his promises, but little by little, when his classes began to get complicated, assignments, exams, he stopped going around. Little by little, Dora's smiling face was fading from his memory, until one day his phone started ringing in the middle of the class. On the other side, he heard a female voice. Hello, do I speak to Kenny Garcia? We called him because his phone number appeared on a piece of paper that we found next to the body of Dora Marquez. Corpse? Kenny couldn't believe what he was hearing. The voice continued. Yesterday, she escaped from the center and turned up dead this morning. 
The cause of her death is still known, but it seems that she died due to a hemorrhage from the number of blows she received. Right after, Penny hung up the phone. His life had turned upside down, and it was never the same again. He managed to graduate, and together with his classmate created the series, Dora the Explorer, in honor of his little friend. As you can imagine, this is a fictional story. In fact, there is no record of the centers at the end of the 90s. And if you start looking, you will probably not find any information of Kenny Garcia. However, we wanted to turn this story around to show you the stark reality of the people crossing the U.S.-Mexico border in search of a better life. Today in Draw My Life, the dark origin of Cat Dog. Cat Dog was one of Nickelodeon's most watched shows. Many remember Cat and Dog as two brothers who shared the same body. But have you ever wondered why did they share it in the first place? Well, since this was one of my favorite shows as a child, I never missed an episode after school. I decided to do some research. The show was created by Peter Hannon, and after a few years of success, its final episode aired on June 15, 2005, after they sadly announced its cancellation. Its characters fascinated me, both the main and the secondary ones. They were disturbing, but they had a charm that captivated my curiosity. By that time, I hadn't seen a show as daring and risky as Cat Dog. However, I always asked myself the same question over and over again. Why did Cat and Dog share the same body? Probably you've also asked yourself this too, but for your fortune or disgrace, I will try to solve the doubt for you. Although far from calming you down, it will just leave you more disturbed. Cat Dog and all the city's inhabitants are products of some scientific experiments. In vivo testing is the use of animals in scientific experiments. It is estimated that up to 100 million animals of various species are used each year. And most are sacrificed after being subjected to cruel chemical tests cosmetic, food, tobacco, and medical training exercise. I couldn't find the exact percentage of how many animals have been sacrificed, since mice, rats, birds, and cold-blooded animals, which account for more than 90% of the animal used in testing, are uncovered by the minimum protections of the U.S. Animal Welfare Act. Therefore, they aren't accounted for. To test cosmetics, house cleaners, and other products, hundreds of thousands of animals are poisoned, blinded, and murdered every year by cruel corporations. But why am I telling you all this? Well, to give you an insight into the terrible reality of animal testing, as the animation tries to depict the tragic life an animal has after being used as an object in a laboratory. On January 13, 1959, Soviet surgeon Vladimir Davidov performed the first ever transplantation of a puppy's head onto the body of another adult dog, a German Shepherd. After three hours of operation, the dog finally began to show some signs of life. An hour later, the adorable puppy was able to move his head. The next day, Dr. Damijov felt like a genius. The dog could move, and the sweet dog stitched into the shepherd's neck was beginning to recover his strength. After having performed this dreadful experiment, it wouldn't be at all surprising that it had been tested between species, such as stitching half a cat's body with another dog's half, another example of the atrocities that humans are capable of. The cartoon never shows how these brothers ended up in the same body, nor does anyone mention their condition. Even in their only film where they try to show us who their parents are, we learn that they are raised by adopted parents who decided to take care of them at a young age. What if the mystery whereabouts of their biological parents is because they were actually made in a lab? This would explain the strangeness of their crossbreeding. Perhaps their adoptive mother is portrayed as a humanoid monster, symbolizing that the real monsters are the humans who experiment on helpless animals. So, which one is your favorite? Let us know in the comments! Thank you for the support, and we hope to see you soon! Ciao!